Across the silvery Nile from Cairo, on the Giza Plateau, in the shadow of the pyramids, is one of the true wonders of the world. For nearly 5,000 years, its existence has been shrouded in mystery, controversy, and uncertainty. How long has it been there? Who built it? And when? Why was it built? Whose face is on it? Are there secret chambers underneath? These questions have confounded kings, explorers, and experts for centuries. But after all the theories, excavations, and disputes, are we finally able to solve the mysteries of the Sphinx? something unexpected, a bizarre object few Europeans had ever seen. The 29-year-old conqueror was in awe of the colossal head protruding from the sand. What is it? What does it represent? He had to know more about this bruised and battered creation and the culture that made it. Napoleon came with a whole team, not, not only a military expedition, which was the main purpose of his visit, but he came with a whole team of surveyors, engineers, scholars, and artists. And for the next three years or so, they proceeded to record what they saw. In fact, in virtually record time, they documented a great number of the monuments of Egypt, including the Sphinx. In fact, there's a wonderful drawing that shows people on the head of the Sphinx with a plumb line measuring it. Many of the tombs and monuments examined by Napoleon's experts were inscribed with what may be the oldest form of writing, hieroglyphics. After the fall of ancient Egyptian civilization in 30 BC, the meaning of hieroglyphics remained a complete mystery for the next 1800 years. In 1799, an officer in Napoleon's engineering corps stumbled across a slab of granite near a city called Rosetta. The stone contained the same message inscribed in three different languages. When fully translated, the Rosetta Stone would prove to be the key to unlocking the secrets of ancient Egypt. When the French were driven out of Egypt by the British in 1801, they left with countless treasures, but without learning any more about the Sphinx. It would be another 18 years before the strange and ruined head would give up any of its secrets. Everyone knows the word Sphinx, but few know its actual origin and meaning. The word Sphinx is a Greek word. Uh, they had a verb, sphingain, which means to constrict, you know, to tighten, to strangle, to throttle. And that's related, of course, to their own mythology of their own sphinx figure. She was a throttler. It's a mispronunciation of a different word. <laughs> um, <laughs> of two Egyptian words, living image. <laughs> sphinx means chesapan. Uh, it's an Egyptian word, Shesa, on living image. Because, of course, that is what these sphinxes were. They were living images. Most of the sphinxes are living images of particular kings. Uh, the great sphinx is a living image of, of a divine king, maybe of the sun god, in an incarnation of a living king of Egypt. 1816. The first known modern excavation of the Sphinx was carried out by a merchant turned explorer, Giovanni Caviglia. Caviglia came in a time he can do anything. He could excavate and drill in any place. No one will stop him. Having heard local rumors and legends of secret chambers and hidden treasures, Caviglia searched for a way inside the Sphinx. He cleared sand from the neck and was astonished to discover that the head was attached to the enormous body of a lion. 
240 feet long and 66 feet high. Between the paws, he found the remains of a small chapel and altar that showed traces of fire. Perhaps the Sphinx was a temple and the altar had been used for burnt offerings. Purposefully and in constant danger of being crushed by shifting sand, Caviglia kept digging. Caviglia came and he had a theory in his mind. The theory, he thought there is a passage, a tunnel from the paw of the Sphinx to the Great Pyramid. This was his theory. He was really the, one of the new ages of thinking about this big tunnel. He excavated everywhere. He found nothing. Caviglia, however, did make a major discovery. The Dream Stella, an upright stone slab containing hieroglyphics. The Rosetta Stone enabled scholars to crack its tantalizing inscription, which they learned dated back to the 14th century BC and recounted the exploits of a royal prince, Tutmosis IV. And he indicates that he slept in the shadow of the Sphinx's head and that the Sphinx was buried up to its neck in sand. The Sphinx came to him in a dream. The Sphinx took to him in a dream and said, my son Tutmos, I'm dying. The sand is killing me. If you remove the sand away, I will make you the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. And we found there is something politics in this story because he killed his elder brother who was supposed to be the king of Egypt. And therefore he was telling everyone that they should forget the crime that he did because the God, it shows him to be the king of Egypt. Well, I would view it as propaganda, <laughs> you know, whether it happened or not. How can you tell, you know, 3,000 years later or something, it's a bit, a bit difficult to say. But uh, it is certainly also to, to say that the, the God uh, decided that this young prince would become king. So it's a way of legitimizing him. The guy was so thrilled. He's a nobleman. He's had money. He got some troops cleaned up the sand, fixed it up, and he became Pharaoh. <laughs> so so the Sphinx, when, when the Sphinx speaks, it really speaks. The dream Stella contained what appeared to be a partial reference to a king of a thousand years before, named Khafre, who built the second pyramid. Tutmosis seemed in some way to be connecting Khafre to the Sphinx, but the inscription was eroded and the intent unclear. The dream Stella would become a benchmark for all future controversies about the age of the Sphinx. Tutmosis was the first to clear the sand away from the Sphinx, but he was not the last. The sand that is brought in by the wind that comes in actually from north of the Giza Plateau and veers by this truck and goes towards the west finds a hole in the ground that has no purpose, as far as nature is concerned. It fills it. So every time the Sphinx is left on its own, that moat is filled with sand. And that happened repeatedly. Numerous excavations of the Sphinx were undertaken throughout the 19th century. But frustrated by the sheer enormity of sand to be cleared away, explorers and archaeologists left most of the Sphinx buried, choosing to work on only certain sections of the monument. Among the many mysteries of the Sphinx are several strange objects on its flanks. So in 1853, Marriott was the first to excavate down along the sides of the Sphinx body, and he immediately found these two large boxes on the south side. On the north side, he found three boxes attached to the Sphinx, made out of stone blocks. Um, now there are only two, so there are four boxes still attached to the Sphinx, and in all the history of uh, Egyptology, it's rather remarkable that nobody really said, huh, why are there big boxes attached to the Sphinx? There's some evidence that these were plinths, or bases, for large statues that flanked the Sphinx body. And it also lends support to the idea that the Sphinx became a popular place of pilgrimage, that the key got turned on the turnkey operation, so that there was not only the Sphinx, but a statue at the chest, possibly divine or royal statues against the sides of the Sphinx, plaques laid into mud brick walls, multicolored. So it was a very rich image in the New Kingdom. And that is possibly an explanation for the boxes. Now, the only box where that doesn't work is the one on the northwest corner. 
the top of the box doesn't look like it could have received a statue the way the other boxes do. And so that's still somewhat of a surprise, somewhat of an unknown jack-in-the-box. Mariette also uncovered the Valley Temple just to the southeast of the Sphinx. This magnificent structure had been buried beneath tons of sand for more than a thousand years. Inside, Mariette found broken statues of the pharaoh Khafre. He concluded that the Valley Temple was part of this great king's death complex and was connected by a causeway to his pyramid. The proximity of the temple to the Sphinx suggested to scholars of the time that the Sphinx may have been created by Khafre. With the invention of film, the Sphinx became a favorite subject of photographers. This photo, taken by Maxime Ducamp in 1849, was the first ever shot at the monument. Thousands more followed. The first moving pictures of the Sphinx, rarely seen, were made in 1902 by the pioneering French filmmakers, the Lumiere brothers. Mostly, the Sphinx was treated as a curiosity and photo opportunity, not as the subject for serious scientific study. Until 1922, when a startling discovery brought international obsession with Egyptian antiquities to an all-time high. An English archaeological expedition headed by a man named Howard Carter sought to uncover the tomb of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh, King Tutankhamun. The world had been given a glimpse of its earliest civilization. The tomb's priceless objects added their story to the jigsaw puzzle of antiquity's mysteries. Interest in the mysteries of the Sphinx was also revived. In 1925, engineer Emile Beret supervised the first full clearing of sand from the monument. He also undertook a highly controversial series of repairs. Paris started this excavation for the uh, uh, Egyptian Antiquities Service and he did also the restoration uh, of the Nemes uh, cloth uh, of the Sphinx, a restoration which would be today um, very dubious. There was a serious thought that, that a bad desert storm might bring the head off and concrete was fitted under the head in a sort of vague approximation of what the original wig would have looked like coming down to the shoulders, not a very good approximation, completely altered the look of the thing. I mean, you look at it now, you look at modern pictures of it, your own modern filming of it, and then you look at these 19th century photographs, it's almost a different thing. Its character was changed terrifically by the, those restorations, which I believe, and some Egyptologists believe, should now be removed. We should get it back to looking like it did throughout most of its history. One of the more unusual looks of the Sphinx appeared during World War II. For the first time, men actually covered the Sphinx in sand, erecting a beard of sandbags to protect the monument from Nazi bombs. Ever since Napoleon first set eyes on the Sphinx, modern man has struggled to solve its mysteries. No written history of the monument has been discovered. No details of its creation seem to have been inscribed in stone or on papyrus. Who made it and when? For what purpose? The answer to these compelling questions can only be revealed by moving forward into the past. The Great Sphinx is a gigantic stone sculpture cut from limestone bedrock. It rests in a moat-like enclosure, quarried out, most experts believe, for blocks to build the pyramids and nearby temples. If this is true, then the Sphinx would have been carved sometime between 2520 and 2494 BC. The monument was a brilliant creation of the most sophisticated culture on Earth. But just how did that culture become so advanced? It is but one more mystery enveloping the Sphinx. It was fashionable at one point to say Egyptian culture sprang from nowhere, or there was a foreign invasion that brought new ideas to Egypt. 
some very interesting, fairly recent work in pre-dynastic and earlier cultures in Egypt has shown obviously that that's not the case. If we go back just before 5,000 years, just before the initiation of Egyptian civilization, the whole scene would be drastically different. In the land west of the Nile, from 5,000 years ago to 11,000 years ago, there were numerous lakes, there was a savanna-like environment, there was vegetation, there were animals, and man. It was a very rich environment. Uh, there were fish in the river to be fished. There were game that were attracted to the waters of the Nile. They really had developed a very advanced river technology that does not translate into civilization. Therefore, something must have happened 5,000 years ago to ignite civilization. Massive drought hit western Egypt in the 4th millennium BC. The lakes dried up, the rivers disappeared, and there was no longer grass for animals. For centuries, this part of the country had been inhabited by desert people, Bedouin-type bands that roamed the land. To save their lives, and those of their animals, the desert people migrated to the only source of water they knew the Nile. They, they had desert wisdom. They knew how to deal with a dry environment. They knew how to deal with rocks. So you have this whole bunch of people that had desert wisdom mixed with very sedentary people that had river technology. And I believe it was really this incredible, interesting mix between the two cultures and the cross-fertilization of ideas that ignited Egyptian civilization. This is when we begin to see evidence of more complex societies. Uh, burials become more complex about the middle of the fourth millennium BC and at the end of the fourth millennium BC, there were certainly uh, rulers over large territories and finally a king that emerged. Upper and lower Egypt were united by King Menes around 3000 BC. Under his rule, Egypt experienced an astonishing rate of social and political growth. A mere 500 years later, by the reign of King Khufu, the Egyptians had developed the knowledge and skills to embark on an extraordinary project, building one of the seven wonders of the world. This was a time of experimentation, a time of bombacity, the culture had found itself and was expressing itself in huge megalithic projects, foremost the pyramids. If we leave it up to Hollywood, we think that the pyramids were built by a tyrant who enslaved his people and had, him, had them cut the rocks under the threat of the whip. There were surely no slaves connected with the building. We know, uh, on the contrary, we know that this was a very specialized uh, force uh, of, we would call it, pioneer force. The plain fact is that here was Egypt with a, a large and highly organized workforce, organized in the first place for agricultural reasons. Um, it, it was just as well to find something for them to do in the slacker period of the year. You know, political stability probably depended on it. If I am king, I'd say, okay, we could collect taxes from these people all through the year, I'm going to get them to work on a project during this dead month. I don't think it was an administrative project in the sense of, you know, um, a WPA project or a wage labor project like the Hoover Dam. I think it was more a turning out of the natural communities of the Nile Valley. They didn't have a choice, but it was considered the obligatory thing to do for the father who ruled you all, which was the Pharaoh, to contribute to these massive projects here at Giza. And therefore, in creating the, the Great Pyramid, Khufu may have also built Egypt as one unbroken nation. It took 23 years for Khufu to construct the Great Pyramid. Some experts suggest that during this time, he also built the Sphinx. But was it really Khufu or one of his successors? Four kings reigned during the fourth dynasty. Khufu, Jedefre, Khafre, and Menkare. Which king?
put his face on the Sphinx. Most people believe that Khafre, the king who built the second pyramid, also carved the Sphinx. The Sphinx is carved in, from a rock within the quarries of Khufu. Do I think it's possible that Khufu made the Sphinx? It's possible, but I think it has a lower probability than that Khafre made the Sphinx. Now we are completely convinced that this is uh, Khufu who has built it, because when you see it in the evening, the light on the face, you see this is the face of Khufu. The Egyptians will never write a paper and say the Sphinx built by Khafre and give you a proof that's really built by Khafre. They will never do that. But we, as archaeologists, working in the field, excavating for the last 30 years around pyramids, we write in books and articles the proof that the Sphinx is dated to Dynasty IV. One day, I hope, when there are further examinations around the Sphinx, one would discover something like a foundation deposit or offerings given to the Sphinx with the name of the one who has carved the Sphinx. Egyptologists are on more treacherous footing when it comes to determining its original purpose, which has proven to be as tantalizingly elusive as a desert breeze. What was the Sphinx? A representation of the sun god? An object of cult worship? The powerful guardian of the Giza necropolis? In the absence of any old kingdom texts, there can be no certainty as to its true purpose. However, a key clue is that the Sphinx faces due east into the rising sun. A Sphinx is the statue of a divinity, and a divinity related to the sun god. Sphinxes are related to the sun god. When the king die, he become the sun god. Therefore, I believe that Khufu is the first king in ancient Egypt that he made a religious revolution. Khufu was the first king in ancient Egypt to say in his lifetime, I'm the sun god. I am Ra. Khufu was uh, the culmination of the royal uh, divinity. And therefore, I believe that the only one who followed him is his son, Kafra, the builder of the second pyramid at Giza. Then Kafra actually made this statue for himself to worship with his two paws, his father. Many Egyptologists believe that the Sphinx was designed to play a specific role within the Giza complex. But was its inclusion planned from the start? Or is it possible that there was already something on the plateau, something older than the pyramids, something older than Egypt itself, something that inspired the creation of the Great Sphinx? When the Fourth Dynasty kings came to Giza around 2500 BC to build their pyramids and funereal complexes, they found a limestone escarpment to the east. There, workers quarried out limestone blocks to construct the new buildings, leaving behind a pit with a large lump of uncut rock in the center. Many experts believe the Sphinx started life as this rocky remnant, that the shape of the leftover stone suggested monumental possibilities. In the, the desert west of uh, the Nile, there are many, many of these uh, wind-scarved features, which we call in geology yardangs, from a Turkic word meaning steep bank. One of them, near the Farafra oasis in Egypt, was a dead ringer to the Sphinx. When I saw this one and photographed it, I knew that I am ready now to speak my, my theory and write it up. <laughs> and the theory is that in the eastern part of the Giza Plateau, there are all kinds of hillocks that have been shaped first by water erosion, then by wind erosion. And the water erosion makes gullies and makes these hillocks stick out from the ground. Then the wind comes to reshape these. The ancient Egyptians could have torn this apart while they were building the pyramid. But they didn't, because they saw beauty in that shape, a clump and an aerodynamic 
back to it. And they decided, my God, this we can modify it a little bit to make it like the shapes in the desert that we've seen. They, they just embellished it, let's put it this way. They just shaped what was already there into what they wanted. In the absence of definitive evidence, we may never know exactly how the idea for the Sphinx originated. What is definitely known is that the monument is heavily eroded and decaying, the body more so than the head. Many explanations have been put forth, but the truth may lie in the rock itself. The Sphinx was quarried right out of the living rock. <clears throat> Uh, like Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, actually, although there it's at the top of a big mountain in, in granite. Here it's limestone. The Sphinx is, is carved of different members of limestone, different layers of limestone. And some of those limestone layers weather much better than others. It's also clear that they knew the layering in the rock already. And they knew that the head layer, <clears throat> I believe, was a very good building stone. And that's why you see detail on the head so well preserved. We call it member three. You see the eyebrows and the eyes and sculpture that's original, I believe, to the fourth dynasty. And then you have member two, which is the body ravaged by weathering. It's a series of layers that go hard, soft, hard, soft, but in general, the layers of the body are quite soft and they flake. The bottom layer, member one, is a good crystalline hard limestone, rather brittle, because 50 million years ago, it was a, co a coral and then a shoal reef underneath the seafloor. And what they carved out of the limestone layers was an amazing creature like none other, a half man, half lion. The ancient Egyptians were fascinated by the idea of mixing species, and this was displayed in their art. The Egyptians were fond of making their own combinations of things. They identified the salient aspects of different things, animals, humans, whatever, and combined them in different and unique ways, identifying animals for their power, like the lion and the bull, for example, and combining them with, or, their, or some, some of their elements with humans, so that that power would rub off on the human, specifically the king, of course. In ancient Egypt, the king always wants to show his power. He wants to defeat his enemies. And as always, you can look throughout the Egyptian history that the king always uh, hit his enemies with his feet in the shape of a lion. Because the lion body is a shape of power. And it was that all-powerful element, that fearsome aspect, that the Egyptians deified and combined with their, with their monarch. You know, in Arabic, the Sphinx is called Abu al meaning father of terror. Father, not in the sense of his fathering terror, but uh, in Arabic, when you say Abu al that is to say uh, that he is um, impressing. He, he conveys terror. 